everybody. Welcome to the first official Body Slam the Competition podcast. I am your host, Chris Adams, and with me tonight is Mike Currents. Our topic today is why kayfabe was better than wrestling today. Now, kayfabe, for those of you who don't know, is what wrestling used to be considered because nobody knew the outcome of what was going to happen, unlike today, where it's plastered all over the internet. And that was one of the great things about it. There was always the 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 mystery of what was going to go down with it. And uh, Mike, you of all people like uh, myself know what it was like to be to that kayfabe era. What's your thoughts on the matter? Well, Chris, this is what I think. I think that wrestling of 15 or 20 years ago was a far superior product all around. And the main reason being is we had that kayfabe. We had that not knowing. We had that believability. When you had some of these guys on the mic, it was amazing. And some of the characters were enough to scare little kids. There's nothing scary anymore. Yeah, I can remember, you know, back in the day when Kamala the Ugandan Giant first came out. Uh, He would come out in the studio wearing a giant headdress and carrying a spear of some sort and had face paint all over his face when the mask came off and stuff painted on his body like they were symbols of some sort and he just looked scary and then all you had to do was look at him you didn't want to watch anymore but a part of you still wanted to watch because you wanted to see you know the good guy go ahead and take this thing on and take him out and then when you see him get in the ring and just start manhandling your hero it just like it's it's crazy it's like man this thing is unstoppable who's going to stop this thing and, you know, that's the whole, the whole mystique about it. Um, the guy himself who was playing that role had played other parts in wrestling before, but at that point in time, no one understood that kind of thing because he came out with a different look and appearance, and no one really picked him out from what he had been before years before. You know, in today's age, now we, uh, we get on the Internet and we Google. Uh, Mick Foley also played Mankind, also played Dude Love also played Cactus Jack Foley um, you, you name it uh, what wrestler out there can't you look up and find out what he's done at any given time and not have any mystery to it at all anymore and, and that's it I mean that that was the death of the mystery and the mystique and the things that kept us coming back <laughs> yeah and I know what you mean as far as it coming back and all I mean it's it's you, you wish it would come back anyway, at least. I mean, the way it is today, that you've got what they call, like, the dirt sheets and everything and what's going on out there where you've got a taped show and people are already putting out the results of the taped show before it hits television. Uh, for crying out loud, TNA Wrestling is recorded three months in advance. You already know who the heavyweight champion is there for the next three months and if it's changed hands at all. You know, where's the fun in that? I mean, there's no fun at all. There's nothing that you were surprised with anymore unlike before when you were shocked when you seen uh, Kerry Von Erich beat Ric Flair for his net for his, his world title because no one expected him to lose it to him but out of nowhere he beats him in front of his home crowd and then the rest is another story of course but I mean the point is it wasn't expected you didn't know what was going to happen exactly I mean today the only time you get a surprise is when there's an injury. And even then, if there's enough time between the injury and the dropping of a title or um, the change of a match, you may even know the new outcome. You know, Give it 24 hours and you're going to know. And it's sad to say, but, you know, I look forward sometimes to seeing guys get a little injury so it throws things completely off because we can, we can know the story, how it's going to go for six months or a year in advance sometimes. Yes, I read an article earlier about you know wrestling today in general, about Seth Rollins having his injury that he took. You know he's going to be out, uh, was it six to nine months, I believe. Uh, he's going to need reconstructive knee surgery, tore uh, two ligaments in his knee. Um, he's going to be down for a while. But... The only thing you're reading about now is how it ruins things for Triple H because at WrestleMania upcoming, they were going to work something out to where they fought each other at WrestleMania, and that was going to be the epic main event. So now instead of worrying about their top company star, who's the champion, 
and his health and will he come back and regain his spotlight they were more concerned about man what's this going to do for Wrestlemania this isn't going to help us out at all you know um, and plus we've seen this the very next day that it happened so the night it happened there was a video out the next morning showing him in the match where his knee kind of buckled under him and gave whereas before back in the day if something happened and someone got hurt they would make a big stage thing out of it like yeah he may have got hurt in the ring but the ref would have alerted somebody that they were hurt and they would have made a big scene out of it like the wrestler he's facing did it and he may do one or more one or two more things that are like hateful to see like stomp at the leg or something but not really hit it to make it look like he's making an insult to injury uh kind of like when they um uh took out dusty Rhodes' leg i think it was his leg i believe his ankle wasn't it back in old nwa days the four horsemen and uh put him out for a little while and i believe he had a legitimate injury but that wasn't the real thing and then he was down for a while then come back and they just you know everything went crazy on the four horsemen at that point that is correct i mean i think that that was the uh the the injury at the hands of rick flair that gave us that hard times promo that everybody knows and loves from dusty exactly that's the one i'm talking about yes and also during the cave babe time which also made it a better era is the fact that when a wrestler was going to uh, go try another company out or was being in a sense traded off because back then they had agreements with other territories where they may have traded talent back and forth there was always a story put in place where there was a loser leave town match or something and that was the ultimate of all matches because you know you didn't want to leave the area where you were running so well in and I remember when um, Randy Savage and Jerry Lawler had their loser leave town match in Memphis, and um, looked like Lawler was going to go down for the longest till you know the infamous third or fourth wind he would get and pull that strap down and start wailing on Savage. Next thing you know, Lawler's the victor, and Savage has to leave town. But just about a month or two later, Randy Savage is now in the WWF. You know that was the cover for that basically. Uh, you know he had to leave town; he was forced to go elsewhere. But in reality, you know, you find out years later that his contract was running out with the Jarrett promotion. Uh, they were talking about negotiating and bringing him back. They wanted him back, but the WWF was interested in him as well. And Savage was kind of interested in expanding his horizon somewhere else. So he was going to accept their proposal. So they worked out something to get him in a loser leave town match, and he's gone. Uh, now today, you don't have that kind of thing going on. You just read on the Internet the next day. Well, you know, so-and-so's contract's over with, and uh, they don't know if they're going to re-sign him, but the Ring of Honor is a place he could go to, or he may go to TNA Wrestling. Well, that's the only two places they can go, really. I mean, you got Lucha Underground. I'm sorry, there's one one more place, really. Unless they want to go to Japan. Right. I mean, th- right. they, they could go to New Japan or All Japan and, and, and leave the country, but there again, not a whole lot of guys really want to do that after they started something over here and made it, you know, at least to the what I call the uh, the semi-big leagues of uh, Ring of Honor and TNA, if we could even consider TNA that anymore. And it depends on the individual, too. Some individuals here don't get the recognition that they want, and they go to someone like New Japan Wrestling, who is definitely interested in them. Um, I'll make a case in point for one of my favorites that doesn't get the recognition he deserves, and that's Cesaro. Whether he's a heel or whether he is playing the face role, either way it goes. Currently, he's a face. The fans are really digging him. He's They're really getting into him a lot. But he doesn't talk with the mic well. And that is keeping him from getting to the spotlight. That should not keep somebody from getting to the spotlight. He keeps the crowd on the you know, edge of their seats. He's freakishly strong. He deserves a title run of some sort. And right now is a perfect opportunity to spotlight someone like him. Although if they do that, they're going to throw out the window everything they've done for Roman Reigns so far. So chances are great that Roman Reigns is still going to get it. But, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. But now, Cesaro is a great case in point because they're somebody that the people love. And they love it because what they're making Cesaro out to be is pretty much what Cesaro is. He's a freakishly strong dude. I mean, to look at him, it doesn't look like he should be able to do the things that he does. But he can, so it's believable. That's why I wholeheartedly feel that he is as well rece- received from the people as he is. Because just like in the kayfabe era, 
when the storylines were believable, when you put your best talkers out there to talk, and the good workers that you have, like Cesaro, who aren't as good on the mic, you gave them a manager who could really spew it out on the mic. So, I mean, in today's world, you would have a tremendously talented guy like The Undertaker, who, let's face it, was never good on the mic. That's why, for so many years, we had Paul Bear. Dude was freaky on the mic. He is what made you afraid of The Undertaker. Right. When he would come out and do that voice and present in the facial expressions and the way he articulated everything about what his Undertaker was going to do, it would scare the crap out of any four or five year old kid. You're right. And nowadays when he does talk on the mic, he still kind of uses that dead man voice routine. Which, I mean, it's pretty easy for anybody who can't really talk in the mic well to pull off. I mean, but why do we not have any managers today like we did in kayfabe? That's another thing that made kayfabe great was the number of managers that you had. Let's name them off a few. You know, I mean, we had Jim Cornette. You had Paul E. Dangerously, which is Paul Heyman today. He's still in the game. Bobby uh, Heenan. Bobby DeBrain Heenan. Uh, J.J. Dillon. Mr. Fuji. Uh, Mr. Fuji, yes. I mean, he wasn't a great talker, per se, but it's the evil Mr. Fuji, you know? I mean, you, you expect him to talk like he does on there, even though he really doesn't, I'm sure. But he played the character very well. And you got Classy Freddy Blassie up until a certain point. I mean, in other places other than there, you know, in the Memphis area, you had Downtown Bruno. Oh, let's not forget Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Oh, and and, they, and Diamond, Dal- Diamond Dallas Page got his start as a manager in the AWA. Exactly, representing bad company, Pat Tanaka and Paul Diamond. And he would would come out every single week and grab that microphone and start rattling off that microphone while the other two sat behind him just watching. And he was, like, very charismatic, and the crowd was really into it. And he'd always end it with, you know, not only are we bad, we're B-A-double-D bad, bad. Company, and and let's, you know? let's even go back to my childhood and... The, when the Hardy Boys first came out, and they had okay. as their manager, I mean that was brilliance, right? Right, and it was that was something that was, it, it wasn't your classic, um, you know, type deal, but it worked very well for them. It, it automatically gave them number one credibility, number two, it gave them somebody with a tremendous amount of experience to learn from, you know, the the tag team game. And he talked for them for a little while until they got into being able to do it better for themselves. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and there was, there's been great managers, you know, other than them. But now these days, now you don't see any managers. There's no no heel managers to really get the crowd on their, um, you know, really, really, really mad in their seats. Like before, you would have General Skandar Akbar would always bring the foreign dude in um, to uh, come against somebody. Uh, now you have Lana. All right. Who, are you offended by Lana? We have Lana Paul Heyman. Heyman. Paul Heyman is, is what I consider the last gasp of breath of the classic manager. Exactly. There exactly. is. I mean, yeah, Dutch Mantel's come back doing the Zeb Coulter thing, but. But he's not really managing, though. It's like he's just siding with the guy. I mean, he's not doing any real. I mean, this, he, he's doing some form of management, I guess. I mean, but when they do interviews, he doesn't talk a whole lot. And let's face it, uh, Alberto Del Rio can talk for himself if he wants to. He's capable of, of, of talking on the mic. He doesn't need a Zeb Coulter. Exactly, you know? exactly. And this is another thing where we show how far we've strayed from kayfabe is that they wouldn't have done anything like that with Zeb Coulter and Alberto Del Rio. No. Be- because it w- people would just look at it and say, what? I mean, I, I did. When, when when I saw it happen, I went, what? Why? Well, well no, I, actually, they did one time something kind of like that. If you're referring to how nobody would think of Zeb Coulter, the red-blooded American, would ever team up with the Hispanic guy, Alberto Del Rio, something similar had happened before. If you remember, when they brought Sergeant Slaughter over to the WWE, and he was managed by 
I'm drawing a blank. I don't think it was Skandar Akbar. It was the other guy. Uh, the one that... Well, no, maybe it was Skandar Akbar that they brought over the WWE to manage him at the time. I'm pretty sure it may have been. Uh, they managed him and uh, the Iron Sheik at the same time, I believe, to represent, you know, the Middle East against Hulk Hogan. But there was storyline involved there. Well, it wasn't really admitted yet, though, that, there, that it was entertainment. It was still WWF. Right, but so, what I'm but, what, what I'm know, saying is is that they they would never have taken two people that had tremendous heat six months prior, and then just throw them together out of the blue in six months with no explanation. You ha- you know yes. they 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 told that story. They had that storyline that that build up to something. I would say yes and no, depending on how you look at it. Uh, depending on what the storyline, if it's a storyline or a feud. But there's a difference in a storyline and a feud. This is true. Storylines are what they do most of the time today. They get their angles, they work, storylines, they got writers for them. The writers write the storylines how they want it to go, what direction that Vince McMahon wants it to go. They write out the words they want the people in the ring to say. Very few wrestlers get to be themselves on stage these days. They're told what to say and that's one thing I I hate about why people don't like Roman Reigns he's just saying what they're telling him to say for the most part maybe if they let him turn loose and be himself he might be more believable on the mic I don't know but one could hope one could hope that his real personality is not white bread mayonnaise surely it's not as plain as that no that's what that's what I every time he picks up the mic I cringe a little a little part of me dies inside when he picks up the mic because I want to like I want to like him. He has talent. He just needs not to talk. I I, I think we had this conversation briefly the other day with somebody else, you and I. Uh, he needs he's got the capability of putting on a great match. He's very athletic. Uh, he's strong. He's fun to watch. The fans back him. But then he picks up the mic and you just go, Ooh, no, not again. You know, it's, please. Yeah. It's like when Lesnar speaks, and it has nothing to do with his ability to get a point across. It's his voice in general. You have this great big Brock Lesnar man, and when he actually talks, it almost is adolescent in the voice tone and and how it flows. So he gets Paul Heyman, and who would not want to have Paul Heyman talking for you? Right. And now... You could, take a, you could take a thousand-pound man in a rascal scooter, and Paul Heyman could make you afraid of him. I can see that. I could. And another thing, the, the, the difference we're talking here between storylines and feuds, back when the kayfabe era was around, they booked feuds. They didn't have writers. They had bookers. Bookers would turn around and find who they thought would make the best possible matchups for the fans to watch. And they would book them in a feud with each other. And they would start out with something small, maybe the, an encounter on television in, in the studio or a run-in on a match um, that happened and cost them something. Something small like that would build up to it. And the feuds were very believable because the people made them believable. Um, some of your talkers back in that day, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Valiant, um, uh, uh, Graham, um, drawing a blank on his first name, I can't believe it, um, Superstar I'll tell Billy you. Graham, uh, so Superstar Billy Graham, I'm sorry. Uh, they made these really good um, talks out there, and none of it was pre-scripted. They weren't told what to say. They come out there, and they were themselves talking, and they made believable, believable talks as that, that you would think they were seriously mad at somebody and looking to hurt them. And that's that's what made it great then. You know, they weren't fed these things. These they were, it's, like, it's like they're wearing an earpiece in the ring now, it feels like. And they're fed these things, and they're just spewing it out as it comes to them. Exactly, and that's and someone who I mean doesn't really get as enough credit I think for their mic skills is Lawler, because Jerry the King Lawler had that look in his eye when he was talking about someone, and you really thought that he hated him. Right. I mean, even look all the stuff that he did with Andy Kaufman. You really thought he was going to kill Andy Kaufman. I mean. Just that look in his eye. He had that look that when he looked at Kaufman, you got scared because you thought Lawler was just going to go rip his head off. And, and the thing that made it extremely believable was the slap heard across the world on the David Letterman show. Oh, yeah. 
And and the funny thing about it was, years and years later, now that we, now that they talk about entertainment, it's all entertainment. There was, it was never real to begin with. Now they all they they put all this out there now, all these videos you can go back and watch behind the scenes stuff, and you listen to Lawler talk and talk about how you know, it was Kaufman's idea for him to slap him. He said, look, he was, can you, uh, are you are, are you comfortable slapping me out there? And he said, what? He said, you know, can do you feel comfortable? Just slapping me across the face out there. I'm gonna say some stuff, some really obnoxious stuff, and I want you to just haul off and and, and and slap me. But you gotta make it believable. And he says, "Well, yeah, I can do it, but you know, are you sure you want me to do it?" And he says, "Hey, anything to make this work." And he was really a big, big fan of wrestling himself, and he wanted to make it work so bad that he would take an open hand slap with him just slapping the taste out of his mouth on national television. And when they did it. If Letterman didn't even know it was coming. They didn't even tell him. Because if he knew, he might not have put that same act on and not given it the credibility of being real. As far as he knew, that was real on TV with him right there that night. And that's what we're missing today. We're missing the realness of it. I mean, reality TV is more real than some of this stuff. And wrestling and truly is going toward a lot of reality TV. Have you seen the new format GFW is going to when it hits TV? I have not. They are going to be doing a format where they're following the wrestlers' daily lives as well as what's going on in the ring. So let's say you've got, um, I don't know their heavyweight champion's name yet. The, the champions were all released a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was. Of who's got what belt right now? Uh, the world heavyweight champion, not only will they be showing his, you know, his matches or whatever, showing him on TV... They'll show tidbits of him on the road, him in the gym working out, him and his family life, and stuff like that. You didn't really see stuff like that back in cafe days because they didn't want you to. Uh, not only that, but in today's age, you, it's not uncommon to see two wrestlers like, for example, Rusev and John Cena sit down and have lunch somewhere together. Whereas back in the cafe days, if you were caught with somebody out in public that you were feuding with or fighting with that was major trouble for you in the, in, in, in the company when you got yes, back some, some, some of those territories would even go as far as to find the talent or let them go um, if they weren't the same amount of money yeah exactly I mean that's why you've seen Ric Flair live the lifestyle day in day out when he was on camera when he was off camera he said he was Ric Flair 100% of the time if people could see him if anybody was in woo distance, they heard a woo from him. And that's how it went. And if he was and, and, feuding with somebody and he seen that person out in public, he would start talking smack to him. And of course, they would talk right back at him and make it real. You got to keep it real. That's I have a it. lot of older older friends, Chris, that um, back in those days were teenagers or maybe even um, upper or you know young twenties that met Ric Flair at the height of his career. And they said he was always so mean and nasty to the fans. Well, yeah, because he was a heel. Right. He wasn't going to, you know, kiss your baby and give you a hug. He was going to tell you to go stick it up your you-know-what, that he didn't have time to mess with the little people. Look, when I grew up and I went to the matches growing up at the fairgrounds in Nashville or any of the small towns around Nashville that they hit, they would have tables set up out there, all right? And they would have where they had the uh, wrestlers signing autographs, uh, signing pictures, signing um, the souvenir uh, brochure that you got that night with the matches listed on it, whatever the case may be. But you did not ever, ever see the two people fighting each other out there at the same time. If Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee were fighting against each other, they were not at the table at the same time. All right? Or you had tables set up at the opposite ends of the building. You had the heels at one end signing autographs, and you had the, the faces at the other end, one of the two. Now, they would all be available for, uh, for for autographs back in the day, which is something else that you don't see today either because right now today they're all so large as it can be right now that with cable and Internet and everything else, you really don't see much of this at the events where you can go to the table and get an autograph from a John Cena or from um, a Randy Orton or Dolph Ziggler or Roman Reigns. Nobody like that. They're not going to be out there signing autographs. You might buy an autograph picture for 20 bucks, you know, at the, at the souvenir stand, but that's all you're going to get unless you catch them out in public somewhere or some kind of event like a Comic-Con or something where they're signing. 
Right, and that really takes away the personal experience that you would get from meeting your favorite wrestler. Right, it does. Now, to kind of throw a little curve here a little bit, uh, talk about kayfabe being better than today, do you think the death of kayfabe is what was also the death of real tag team wrestling? I don't, I don't really think that that's what was the nail in the coffin for real tag team wrestling. Um, I think what happened there is a multitude of different things. Number one being there for a while you had the WWE and that was it. Um, everybody wanted to be the top, the singles. You had such a dominant team in the Dudley boys. No matter where they went, they were on top. They could be in the WWE, they were on top. They go to TNA, they were on top. Anywhere they went, you know, even further back, they were on top. When you have somebody that's always on top in the top company, it's not really something you're going to want to do. But with the Dudley boys, though, now they were there not all together after kayfabe. They were there, I'm sure, wrestling for some organization before ECW, and I don't know who it may have been. Uh, although I don't know, because Bubba Ray Dudley had said that Paulie e. Dangerously is the one that found him, Paul Heyman found him at a show one night and put him out there wrestling as a solo kind of guy, and then later put him together with Devon. So I would have to say, actually, they came together after the K- the whole kayfabe deal, really. So if you think about it, what I'm, what, what I'm putting out there is, with kayfabe during time, you had the Rock and Roll Express, you had Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. You had the Road Warriors. You had the Midnight Express, the Fantastics, the Fabulous Ones. You had the Killer Bees. You had the Heart Foundation, the British Bulldogs. I mean, we could name the Midnight Rockers. And we could keep going on and on for a while because you had Demol- Demolition, Powers of Pain, you know, quite a bit. And then all of a sudden we get this announcement from Vince McMahon that, you know, it's never really been real, and I don't expect you fans to believe that these guys are really day in, day out, you know, killing each other. It's all entertainment. We do the best we can to entertain our our our, our fans, and anything less than them is a slap in the face if we tell them otherwise, which I thought was the dumbest move ever because even though no one admitted in kayfabe time that it was fake, we all knew deep down that it wasn't real, but we still had the mystique of some things being legitimate. And then after that point, it seemed like you didn't see much from tag teams anymore because the Rock and Roll Express was no longer welcome, basically, in WCW. They had moved on to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. They had just started with Jim Cornette. The Midnight Express was gone. Um, They were throwing together tag teams uh, to make something happen. And then suddenly they came out with the next generation, I'll say, of tag teams. You had the Steiner Brothers in Doom the Varsity Club, um, the Skyscrapers. And then you go to the WWF, and who would you have at that point? The Dudleys, Edge and Christian, um, the Hardy Boys, the New Age Outlaws. Uh, there were, it was a little bit different feel to it at the time when those when those guys were all running their tag team divisions. You're right, you're right. Um, I think what we saw at that point, too, like you said, beforehand you had bookers. And then you had writers. Well, there for a while, we had a good, probably a, almost a decade's worth of overlap where some of your bookers became writers, and we're getting farther and farther away from that. And as we get farther away from that, I, as, that's how I've really, when I've really noticed the downturn in tag team wrestling, it's also where I see the loss of the manager and the talking valet that really makes a difference. Um, I think it has a lot more to do with that generation of bookers that became writers now retiring or moving on in their lives than it does with the actual break in kayfabe. Were you around for the opening originally of TNA Wrestling? I believe it was called um, more like NWA, Total Nonstop Action or something like that. It wasn't quite TNA, 
as you see it today. It was a little bit different. Jeff Jarrett had just opened it, basically, and brought together some names from um, some of the older generations to come in and help run the place. Uh, but you can see them on YouTube. You go YouTube it fairly well. You can see some of the older stuff. They had, they had Dusty Roads there for a while, which I didn't know. I didn't catch it from the very beginning. Uh, but they had Dusty Rhodes there for a little bit, and Dusty Rhodes brought in appearances by Nikita Koloff and um, Van Vader. Jeff Jarrett was there wrestling. You had some other people there. Uh, the the Harris brothers, I believe, had come in. Uh, they were more of like a, a Memphis staple than anything. But um, at the time, it had a kayfabe kind of feel to it, the way they were doing it. A kayfabe slash Booker kind of mentality. Uh, Dusty Rhodes was helping run the show backstage and everything, and booking matches and stuff. Jarrett was booking matches, putting their creative minds together and everything, and things were going well. And um, they turned around, and Dusty had left, of course. Uh, Jeff Jarrett was running the show and brought in names like, at that point, AJ Styles and Chris Daniels and uh, people of, of that nature, Chris Saban. They had the Octagon Ring. They had that new belt division they were working on. That was uh, everybody was all great about and everything, and he brought in a lot of new talent that no one had seen before. So there was hope for competition against uh, you know WWE and WCW. But something happened along the way that when Jeff Jarrett left, they brought in the writers at that point, which uh, the main writer they brought in, um, I want to say, was uh, the guy from WWE. They sent to in to, they sent to WCW. Uh, they made the whole NWO bit. Vince sorry. Russo. Vince Russo, yes. Uh, and actually, I take it back. Vince Russo was brought in there while Dusty was there in TNA. And Dusty had left soon afterwards. I think Vince Russo was gone uh, not too long after that because they brought in Jim Cornette. And Jim Cornette couldn't work there with him either. And he left. So when they were seeing how nobody could work with Russo or anything, I believe, it, I believe they let him go eventually. And that's when Dixie Carter and her whole um, group had come in at that point in time. Jeff Jarrett was selling it out, I guess. He sold a little over half of it, and they bought the controlling shares and was uh, trying to run the thing. And Dixie Carter has no direction whatsoever for wrestling. She's got all the money in the world to pay people, but she's got no direction whatsoever. If they And, and that company's folding. I'm sure they're going to fold. There's not much left of them. But if they could take that company with her money, her family's money, and put it together with the direction of a ring of honor and put those two together... Wow. I mean, that's something else there. It, 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 it has a kayfabe kind of feel to it in a way. Ring of Honor does to me. It has that kind of feel, but I'm sure like every other, all the rest of it, it's probably got you know a writer behind the scenes. And you're absolutely right because, I mean, even NXT has that kayfabe feel sometimes. When you watch, you, you get that feeling sometimes from it. And... I know there for a while that they, they had Dusty doing a lot of the booking slash writing for NXT. So maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe it just has something to do with what we grew up watching, Chris, and what we expect from the product, not really being what we get anymore. I mean, even the Attitude Error gave us some believable characters and some good stories and some decent mic skills and we didn't completely have the internet spoilers that we do now. But since I would say, I don't know, 2001 till now, it's just been a slow progression of the product seems to be getting worse and worse. And with the spoilers and you, you can't get on Facebook now Without something from the WWE trending over here on Twitter universe or whatever it is telling you what the heck's going to happen on Monday Night Raw on on Sunday afternoon. Right, and is it really truly that the talent's getting worse or is it just that the writing's getting worse? Because I don't think the talent's getting worse. No. I think I think what it is is that there's a lot more restriction on them because of safety. It's it's been it's been fluffed a little bit. They don't do the things they used to do, the amazing stuff that we grew up watching. I mean, let's take just for a second. I know we're getting off track a little bit, but let's take Big Van Vader. Here you have a guy that's what six eight, six six, four hundred and sixty pounds. I'd say about six six, four hundred. So yeah, 
doing a moonsault off the top rope. Exactly. I mean, when does... I don't think I've ever seen Rusev go up to the, to the middle turnbuckle. And I don't know that you will, because if you remember not too long ago, somebody encouraged Brock Lesnar to do that moonsault type move off uh, the top rope. It's not, it wasn't the moonsault, it was called something Shooting else. Star Press. He did it. And, and he did it he, twice. And he, he hit, landed on his head both he, times. Yes, that's what I'm talking And I think that's one of the things that has steered them away from a lot of people doing it as far as the bigger people go. They want their big guys to be big guys and pummel people. They want their Nevilles to turn around and do the high flying stuff. The Lucha Dragons, your Neville, uh, even Seth Rollins as far as that goes, doing his uh, move off the top rope he does sometimes, similar to Neville's, if not the same. I mean, that's what they're, they're looking for, those guys to do those type moves. But they don't want to see the big guys taking risk anymore. It's like of uh, Sid Vicious coming off the top rope and seeing his knee just crack under him uh, that time. They don't want that to happen to their guys no more. They'll suplex him off the top rope or throw him off the top rope, but they won't let him jump off the top rope. But, but but even that is very few and far between, Chris. Right. You know, and we... W- I think there's a lot of saddling of what the talent can and cannot do because of safety reasons. Um, the, you know... There's been a lot of of uh, tragedy recently. Exactly, a lot of tragedy. There's a lot of things we're looking at nowadays. It's not only is it the high flying stuff has been a lot of it cut out for the bigger guys. You've also got uh, people in the past that were on the um, you know juice. You know Scott Steiner, for instance, ju- juiced up. It's no no it takes no common sense. No, he juiced up looking at him, the genetic freak that he was. And then you've had people in the past dying of heart attacks at early ages that they were pretty much saying was due to because they've taken painkillers and other drugs during their time of coming up. Uh, steroid issues has something to do with them. Um, I'm not going to bring up the infamous name when we talk about steroid talk. That's another talk for another day. And I know you know what I'm talking about on that one. But uh, they've got all kinds of steroids, pain uh, pain pill addictions, uh, things like that that would get people off track. And so then I was watching that more carefully to make sure no one's getting along those lines. Because you got wrestlers from the past coming back to, to to sue the companies now, trying to get a quick buck now. Because oh, back yes. in the day, you know, they said that you know we had to show out or we wouldn't get a check. So I did everything I could to make sure I could show out. I stayed bulked up and I stayed working the whole time. I took pain pills to make sure I wasn't hurting when I played. You know, now it's killing me and now I want some money. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff all combined in one. And truthful, really truthfully, down. you don't see a lot of old wrestlers from the 80s on up. Maybe even late 70s. I mean, you got... It seems like the guys from the 50s and 60s lived a long time. Your, your Luthezes, your Vern Gagnas, your classy Freddie Blassies. You know, these guys... These guys... They seem to live into old age. But look at the way they were back then. Look at what shape they kept themselves in. Look at, the, you know, Jack Briscoe, uh, Jerry Briscoe, you know, the ones there was, well, they were like McMahon Stooges for a while, right? Yeah. One of them was, anyway. Um, you know, he's still alive today, I believe, is he not? Um, I think Jerry Briscoe's alive. I think Jack Briscoe's passed away. Okay. So you got these guys back in the day, they weren't bulked up. You didn't have your Ultimate Warriors, your Hulk Hogan's. Your um, your road warrior Scott Steiner type looks back then. You had people who were along the lines of sizes of, um, well, you know, like a Jerry Lawler size. They may have had a small gut. Uh, they may have been the size of like the Midnight Express, who were not strong, muscle bound men, but still they were. Of right. You size. had your you had your Bob Backlunds, your Bruno San Martinos. Um, right. You know, Bruno was probably one of the the biggest as a, as in muscular. Guys, probably from that that pre pre steroid era. Bruno San Martino was 100 percent legit. And if you look at him today, I seen a picture of him not too long ago with his shirt off and flexing. And the man still pumps iron oh, today. The man is in a, is in incredible shape. Not only him, but if you've ever seen Adrian Street at the retirement, Adrian Street was one of those guys back in kayfabe time that was like you know the exotic Adrian Street. He'd put the the, the makeup on his face and the flamboyant blonde hair and had the 
the, 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 the female valet spraying the perfume on him all the time to keep him smelling pretty. That was his gig, you know. That's what he did. And not today's age, if you look at him today, um, he shaves his head. I don't know if he shaves his head bald or if he's just bald or what the deal is. But the man's got muscles like nobody else out there. He could still take on probably, if it was just a, an arm wrestling contest, probably take on half the guys out there today. So, but back, and, and, back and, and to what you were... Uh, no steroids is what I'm getting at. No steroids. Right. Between him or San Martino you brought up. No steroids were used during that time frame. They were legitimate, hardworking men that worked on their physique and got it there and kept it there. And that's why they're still alive today. Well, back up, back up a little bit here on... You were asking earlier if you thought it was a, the break of, the break of kayfabe that is making it worse, or if the talent is less talented. I I, I wholeheartedly believe that it is the breaking kayfabe. Um, I I will hold nothing against any of the talent that's out there right now. Any of those guys could make it big. The only problem is is that there's only one place really to do it in right now. And they can't all be on the top. So we see people that we really want to get pushed, like you said, Cesaro, shuffled to the back. Your Dolph Ziggler's get shuffled to the back. Your Randy Orton's, they you see these glimmers of, of hope and greatness comes out, and then something happens, there's an injury, and all of a sudden, shuffled to the back. You know? And... And, and it, it, it's crazy to think that we live in a time where the WWE can just give up a talent like Alberto Del Rio. The guy was an incre- is an incredible talent, and, you know, but they just had somebody else to come along and take his spot. They have so much incredible talent, and they're not really using them. They could have so many different feuds. They need if if the WWE is going to stay this big and keep this these many um, wrestlers employed, they need more titles. They need they 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 do. They need they need to brand split again and have two different shows. Make it almost like two different companies. I made the same argument not too long ago. Uh, you know, I do some uh, some videos uh, as well as this podcast here, and I made the very same argument. That I said WWE needs to have three separate companies, and they can, I and mean, not really companies per se, but the brands have to be separate from each other completely, like a company. Like Raw would be one, SmackDown another, NXT a third, and SmackDown needs its own stuff. They may not have to have a world heavyweight champion. You may say the U.S. champion is what highlights the show there, and the heavyweight champion comes by and defends the title every now and then, right? It could be something like that. But, you know, that's something that we'll have to get into another time, really, as far as that goes, as far as uh, uh, another topic to talk about, because that's really something we can make an hour on right there by itself. Oh, maybe and, too. <laughs> I mean, e- easily. And we and if we should, you know, next time we get you on here, we should talk that over about uh, splitting the brands up again and making it seem like separate companies, so like where they have contracts for each company and stuff like that, and the wrestlers can't go back and forth from Raw to SmackDown. There's no invasions no, nothing like that. It's kind of more of an older feel to it. That way, you've got an ability to show to showcase all the talent, um, and it's, they're not overshadowed by the big names that are on there the whole time and pushed to the back or anything. So uh, exactly, you could yeah. have you could you could have all all of that, and that could help you set up better storylines and 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 better outcomes and more variety because that's what. I crave as a fan. I want some. I want some more variety. You go to you go to even indie shows today, and you don't know what's going to happen because they're not you know out on the out on social media putting it out. It's exciting. the The product may not be as crisp and clean around the edges as the mainline TNA or WWE, but I go and I watch because I don't know what's going to happen. And that's the exciting thing for me. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're kind of pushing our way toward the end here. Uh, we're about to run out of time. So is there any final thoughts you have on that cafe being better than the current wrestling we have today? Anything in particular that you miss and would like to maybe see brought back or something like that? I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting old. 
and getting into that uh, get off my grass mindset. <laughs> but um, I really just believe it was better back then. I just I really wish that they would get all of the talent off of social media. I know that's that's hard, and I know that they've put them on there purposefully. But I really wish that there was no hashtag the real Seth Rollins or any of that crap. I want to be surprised every Monday night. Well, unfortunately, I think we've reached a day and age where that's just not going to happen anymore. Although it's always been about the money, I think they more or less uh, stress it's about the money these days with all the different things they do. So I'm pretty much at the point to where we either had to accept and move forward with the product at hand that we have and uh, just go back and relive the past through YouTube or videos or something and enjoy it that way or just not watch it at all because that's pretty much the way it's going. It's not going to go back to kayfabe era. They're not going to have bookers anymore. We're always going to have writers and storylines. They're going to push who they want at the top, who they think can really represent the company the best. Um, there are people who's going to get shoved back. You wait, you wait and see. Seth Rollins will come back. There'll probably be somebody in the next six to nine months that's better product for the company at the time the fans are into and he won't come back immediately to that heavyweight championship spotlight he'll be fighting for the u.s title or the intercontinental title he'll find himself in that same rut that cesaro and roman reigns and dolph ziggler has been in for the last year practically and that's how it'll be for him as well so but there is one thing we can be thankful for, Chris, because if, if, if the past has shown us anything about professional wrestling is that it is always evolving. So maybe one fine day we will evolve past what, we're, what we have now into something not as good as it was, but better than it is. Well, we could always hope, right? All right, so what we'll do, if you like, uh, you know, we're always uh, glad to have you on here, Mike, and we'd like to have you back on here again sometime. Maybe we'll get you back on here, and we'll talk about the whole brand split and everything if you want to, and uh, bring that up again another time. Would that be good? That would be great. All right, great. We would really love to have you back on here again. So I'll go ahead and close things up here. Basically, it's all we have for this episode today. We're running real short on time. Um, just to let you guys know, uh, the website after you want to go to, www.bodyslamthecompetition.com. That's where we keep the blog at, and at the top of the page, you have links to the YouTube page to make sure you go there and like and follow the YouTube page, or subscribe to the page, I should say. Um, if you have any thoughts or comments on it, please let us know that uh, what you thought about it. Uh, drop some uh, comments on the blogs that are put up. Um, and uh, if you're not a, currently a subscriber to the blog, make sure you subscribe to that as well and get on the mailing list where we can send you the newsletter out. Until next time, uh, you guys have a great time. Mike, thanks for coming on with us. I uh, look forward to talking with you guys again. Everybody have a great day, okay? This is Chris with Body Slam the Competition, and we'll talk to you guys later. Good night. <laughs>